All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 26th day of October in the year of our Lord, 2022. I had a comment on a video. Uh, the person asked me, why do I speak against the Trinity? And I said, what? I don't speak against the Trinity. I speak against man-made standards of creeds and confessions because they're not the authority of Scripture. Um, but that doesn't mean I disagree necessarily with the content of those things just the authority that's given to them, and they're used as a standard for Christian fellowship rather than Christ himself. Oh, my. Uh, you know, Christians, we, we don't come... We, when we come to Christ, we don't come like John the Baptist, filled with the Holy Spirit from our mother's womb, okay? We're not immaculately conceived, either. We come with baggage, and it affects how we understand the Scripture. And the Christian life, a lot of what's involved in Christianity as being a Christian is becoming conformed, our minds being conformed to the Word of God, transformed by the Word of God, uh, understanding, growing up into the fullness of Christ. Every time I look at the Scripture, when I'm looking through there, with a, I find things I didn't know, I did, I, things I, I never saw before. Uh, overt expressions of the deity of Christ, it, it, right there in the Greek language that's not just in the English. Okay, so there's... But that's not the essence of Christianity, is do you trust in Jesus Christ? Does Christ dwell in you? That's what makes you a Christian. We can be confused and still be a Christian. You can have all kinds of bad ideas and still be a Christian. You know, when you got 46 years in perspective, you, I can look back over my own ideas and say, yikes. Some of them are pretty bad. And there's a lot of things I still struggle with. We're, we're human beings. We're finite. We're going to have problems. So, But I want to, I saw a, uh, a young man with a anti-Calvinist mess uh, that he just put up uh, yesterday, the 25th. Somebody that calls himself Faith on Fire. Uh, I ran across this young man some time ago. Uh, he had a series of it. I don't, you know, YouTube just puts these things on your homepage and and uh, hoping you'll click on them. Anyway, this man was defending women pastors, trying to defend it from the Bible, and I I I'm, I'm not sure if I was the one that convinced him, but I went through the scriptures and said, no, 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 this is what the Bible says about it, and then he changed his mind. I'm not claiming that I was responsible for that or not, but I'm afraid I was, <laughs> in a sense, because he's coming out with this um, this anti-Calvinist thing. This is just the latest one, and I'm afraid he's been listening to me. <laughs> and I want him to, to, to maybe clarify his understandings, or maybe I haven't been clear enough. So... Uh, <sighs> And I want to explain right off the top, Calvinism is a broad spectrum. And this, this young man is ignorant of Calvinism, uh, really is. And if it, I am the only thing he's get, been getting, he's been getting everything that's wrong with Calvinism because I've been focusing on the problems. But that isn't what Calvinism is altogether. That's just the problems. You know, when you're an engineer, you look at the problems. You don't talk about what's right with it. You talk about what's wrong with it, okay? Because that's what you're concerned about, with what's wrong with things. <sighs> uh, okay, I, now, so I saw, I'm going to go through this video. It's 15 minutes long, and this might take a while, but it's important. 
uh, and if you're going to do videos against something, you better you, please make sure you understand what you're doing. I, I think social media might be something that is generally bad. And this makes me wonder if I should have a microphone. I don't know. Uh, I'm afraid I might have been influencing people in a way that's not entirely accurate. Because it's it's they're getting just you're looking at the problem, okay? Uh, when I'm talking about John MacArthur, for example, I'm talking about the problems with John MacArthur, not everything about John MacArthur. Or uh, now, some places like I with like Rick Warren, it's hard to find anything right about him. Uh, John Piper, you know, what can you do with a Christian hedonist? Some of this stuff is just just trying to show what the danger is in it or potential. But a lot of these things, when you're talking about something like uh, Reformed theology or Calvinism, I mean, let me see. Where, where, where is... Have you read Calvin's Institutes? Do you have access to his entire set of commentaries, which is I have on software? Uh, and then, Cal then from Calvin, you also have Calvinism is not simply Calvin. Now, Calvin apparently held to universal atonement. Now, some try to contest that because it, they think it's not logical as part of his system. But Calvin is not a system. He's more systematic than Luther, but <laughs> okay. And we need to keep in mind too that the times and place that Calvin lived, the hostility, the the Reformation was, I mean, Rome was out to destroy it. The Empire was out to destroy it. Geneva's this little isolated place up in the Swiss mountains. Uh, hoping that nobody notices them. Uh, in a, Switzerland was divided into uh, Protestant and Catholic uh, cantons, counties. Uh, so they had neighbors that were that were even within their own little country that were hostile. And then you had heretics like what was his name that that was executed at uh, uh, the doctor uh, that was executed at Geneva, with cause. Okay, he was already under a death sentence from the the Catholics, and he had escaped. He denied the Trinity. <laughs> All right, so uh, there's a lot of people that that like to distort. I hope I don't try to distort what other people are teaching. I try not to. I try to go to the source, original sources. Uh, it's like you know, I've got a copy of this book that I just got. I just I look in here again, and I, I, it makes it so sickening that I don't even know if I want to talk about it. <sighs> once upon a time, let me say this. Once upon a time, I remember reading through this book, and I knew there was something wrong with it, but I couldn't put my finger on it. I couldn't put my finger on it. I said, Lord, there's something really disturbing about this book, but I don't know what it is. I don't see any... Thing a denial of what you say, and then I sort of was uh, inspired to uh, look at how he handles scripture, and then I looked, and with that thought in mind, I went, "Oh, that's the problem. That's the problem. Why does he use a dozen different translations, including things like the?" Today, he uses, even uses translations I don't have on Bible works. In other words, it's that bad. Uh, TEV, today's English version, I remember that. Um, um, the Message Bible, I don't have access to the Message Bible. No reputable software puts that on there as a Bible. Uh, and then I realized that this, this is not, you know, and today I look at this, say, this isn't about Christ at all. See, our understanding gets refined as we encounter things. My encounters with the, the Church of the Nazarene, and hey, there's something not quite right here. What is it? 
Oh, they're not preaching Christ and Christ crucified. How about that? Uh, the the whole thing's about personal holiness, not about imputed righteousness. It goes back to they don't believe in penal substitutionary atonement. I thought everybody did. See, you don't necessarily realize what the problem is. But Calvinism is... <laughs> okay, start by reading this book with your Bible. And when you understand what Calvin's saying, you don't have to read the whole thing. I mean, th there are... The reason you don't have to ho read the whole thing is there's nothing wrong with most of it, okay? It is a few things with Calvinism where there's a problem. Only a few, and they are not fatal. So let's, uh, let's go. I find myself defending Calvinism today, at least against a gross caricature. You know, it's like listening to Leighton Flowers. Leighton Flowers, he just needs to shut up because he's always putting his foot in his mouth. And then it's like, I, but I can listen to Leighton Flowers. And I can know what he's trying to say. Like when he's talking about choice meats. But no, there's people like James White out there that will just take that and squash you with it. Because he's a he's a, a debater. It's not about search debates aren't about searching for the truth. They're about crushing your opponent to the applause of the crowd. <laughs> James White doesn't even do that anymore. But that that's what a debate is. It's an it's a spectacle, an entertainment event, a sporting event. Your side versus the other side, who's gonna get crushed? That's what it is. Just listen to the, the political debates, uh, what the reviews of them. Who won? Who crushed the other side? That's not what it's about. Okay, so let's, uh, let's listen to this, and I'm going to try to correct. Uh, this man is not knowledgeable on Calvinism, and if he's just got his knowledge from Calvinism, like by something that I said, for example, he's going to have a very skewed knowledge of it. It's like if I did a video on fixing my van while I was complaining about the spark plug location and everything else, what would you get? You'd get you'd, you'd get an idea of my vehicle based on me fixing it, what was wrong with it. It normally serves me very well. In fact, it's serving me very well again after $153 worth of parts. But that's a whole lot cheaper than buying a different vehicle. I thank God for my... 20 year old minivan with 260,000 miles on it because it serves its function well. <sighs> All right, let's go and look at this video. I'm going to do split screen. Okay. Oh, by the way, the picture in the background, let me show. I'm going to try to show you that picture without. Uh, uh, let's see, how can I do that here? Uh, no, I don't want to blank that one out. Let me... Okay, this is the garden tomb. Uh, that is, could very well be the tomb of Jesus. And the, Jesus, this is a picture that I took back in the 1980s with the Canon T70 camera film. Uh, this is not a picture that I got from someplace else. No, I was there. I looked in the tomb. Uh, this is the garden tomb. Yes, it is. So that's that's the picture in the background. I just had to show you that. So because it reminds me of this is probably very likely. See see the 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 place for the stone in the front here, and it's carved into a into a, uh, the side of a hill. It was a it was a new tomb. How do I know it was a new tomb? Because because it was unfinished. There's a place for two bodies, and one of them hadn't been finished uh, Finished carving it out. Uh, let's see, when you come in, it seems to me the, the place where Jesus would have been lying, I can't remember if it was to the left or the right. It's not a, a big 
a cave. It's not like a deep cave in here. It's carved out. And uh, it's in a ancient garden. Just it, actually, if you're in Jerusalem at the Damascus Gate and you look back to the hill that looks like a skull that's right across the road, uh, if you're on the wall, for example, this is sort of like right behind the hill on the back side of it. So you're, it's very close to where Jesus was probably crucified. And it would have been a rich individual that owned this, too. I mean, everything fits, including cracks in the stone. See these cracks over here? I don't know if you can see that on your screen or not. That are caused by earthquake, an earthquake. So it, it fits the biblical description pretty much to a T. This is garden tomb. All right, as it was at least in nineteen mid mid nineteen eighties. All right, so now we're going to go over to this video. I just wanted to 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 show that uh, that's the picture in the background, uh, which is probably more. <laughs> that's probably better than looking at my face, or this other thing over here too. But so. Uh, <clears throat> This is sort of like no. This is not how you how you criticize Calvinism or anything else. So let's take a look at the issues involved here. Faith on fire. I I don't doubt his uh, his enthusiasm, and he was willing to change. Again, I don't know w what the cause was, but I do know I interacted a bit. Uh, pointing, I think I actually did a video pointing out what the scripture actually says, or it might have just been in comments. I don't know about women in ministry and then he apparently somehow somewhere got the idea that the bible actually does restrict it to men because there's no biblical basis for women <laughs> being in authority over men some people we, we have beliefs we have all kinds of beliefs that we pick up from others and if you don't think you do well <laughs> You are, uh, you've deceived yourself. And again, part of growing up in Christ is to clean house, get the leaven out. I've been trying to do that for 46 years. Okay, so here we go. Um, Welcome back, everyone. This is Faith on Fire, and I'm Brian. And in today's video, I'm going to show you something very interesting on a slideshow that I created here that's going to help to explain why Calvinists and non-Calvinists never are going to see eye to eye on the scripture. We could read the same Bible passage. We could read the same exact Bible verse. And if it pertains to salvation, there's a very specific foundational reason why we're going to come up with completely different interpretations. False. <laughs> no. No, that's not true at all. Uh, uh -uh. Calvinists are Orthodox Christians, okay? I don't mean like Eastern Orthodox Christians. They just have a few things that have been exaggerated by Calvin's followers. Now, Calvin was, uh, as far as determinism, yeah, Calvin was very good, hot on that. Uh, Luther even more so, by the way except their followers went different directions. Uh, the, the Calvin's followers tended to amplify that. Luther's followers tended to diminish that, both coming from Augustine. And maybe it's, uh, Calvin might have emphasized some of Augustine's things a little bit more than others did, but uh, yeah, so there's a reason what's going on here, and I'll try to explain it. But no. No, we're, th this illustration here is particularly bad. I just want to also call your attention to, to keep something in the back of your mind as you're listening to this presentation. Exactly how much Bible are you getting here? Where is the actual biblical texts that are being referred to? 
Something you should always think about when you watch people on YouTube. Or listen to the pastor in the pulpit. Or are the pastor in the pulpit. And we can debate this all day long. It's just, just we're not going to come together. Now, before I explain that a little further and get to what that foundational basis is that keeps us apart, once we then look into Scripture at the same exact spots and come away with different interpretations, I'm going to use this as an illustration. So instead of salvation, we're going to first, as an analogy, talk about the Bible believes. You know, when you start talking about analogy, you start talking, you sound like a, a Reformed theologian. This is a really bad analogy. Why? Because this is the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian. Perhaps. But even that, this is a bad analogy. What's the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian? The Christian trusts in Jesus Christ. The non-Christian doesn't. And, and the very subject here, the comparison here is between a uh, on the origin of the universe, okay? Uh, evolution is not about the origin of the universe. No, evolution has nothing. Darwin had nothing to say about the origin of the universe. See, this is, uh, well, conflating things that should not be conflated together. I guess that's the whole problem here. Versus the evolution believer and the origin of the universe. Have you noticed that ever since evolution was introduced, that there have been those who, I mean, they just keep extending how long the universe, you know, it's billions and billions of years now and so forth for evolution to take place. And we have what we have today, according to the evolution believer. And the Bible believer believes that the word of God is correct, that not only in Genesis did God say he created everything in six literal days and rested on the seventh, but even in the Ten Commandments. In Exodus 20, God reiterates that when he uh, gives us the commandment about remember the Sabbath day. And in doing so, he explains, because I created the earth or the whole universe in six. Okay, so we've got a whole bunch of different issues involved here. Evolution has nothing to say about the origin of life, per, per, really, or creation itself, uh, the existence of the universe. It, that's not part of the actual theory of evolution is about the evolution of life into different species. Now, there are people that that are that believe in the theory of evolution and are Christians. I believe authentically Christians. They are just confused <laughs> because they're trying to hold on to something that the world the world tells them is science and fact and proven, while also holding to Christ. You can do that. You you can believe a lot. You you can believe that that Joe Biden is a good president because of something. <laughs> And believe that Jesus Christ is your Savior and Lord. There are confused Christians. Okay, so, so this is not, you cannot co uh, contrast a Christian with a non-Christian based on this. And he's not even talking about evolution. He's talking about the origin of everything. Creation versus non-creation. Now, let me point out that scientists don't believe in non-creation either <laughs> nowadays because of something called the Big Bang where they realized because based on evidence they realized that the universe had a beginning <laughs> it's just a matter of dating that that the problem is uh, they've got other kind of problems too like how did the universe expand several times faster than the speed of light huh <laughs> and where did the where, where was the quantum fluctuation? How can you have a quantum fluctuation in nothing? Huh? See, science is a lot of BS mixed with some facts. It's a narrative. That's what it is. Evolution is a, narr a narrative to explain why things are the way they are, which also is true of Calvinism.
and Arminianism and all the other systems of theology and uh, uh, dispensationalism and Roman Catholicism and you name it, narratives. Okay, so let's, let's go back and I'll distract myself here. Literal days and rested on the seventh. That's what it says. So the Bible believer... And let me, let me point out that a six-day literal... Uh, I am a literal six-day creationist because I believe that God can do that without a problem. Now, there are people that are their minds are still wrapped up in the world. And just, you know, uh, this doesn't seem right to me. I mean, couldn't have been... Just because a person wanted to say six ages does not mean they're... Uh, yeah, that's a matter of biblical interpretation. I don't think it's correct, but that is not a matter... Of, that's not the difference between being saved and being lost. What does the Bible say? You're saved because you believe in the six-day literal creation? No. Let's... You know, um, C.I. Schofield in the Schofield Reference Bible had some really weird stuff. I believe he had six ages rather than six days. It's not it's not new. It's not determinative of the gospel, of your relationship to God. You're simply ignorant. I believe it's six days. Why not? And the word yom, day, almost always is used of a literal day. But that doesn't prove it. And it's not... There's a lot of it, it. It comes. It creates a lot of problems if you don't hold to six literal days. However, that doesn't mean you're not a Christian. It just means you're a confused Christian. Let me just go through this for you. Okay, we'll, this is really bad. This illustration. Gonna, this is going to really kind of help. So you've got a Bible believer versus an evolution believer. Now see. Evolution is not even what he's talking about. He doesn't even know what evolution is. Or at least he's confusing it. He's conflating evolution with uh, a theory of origins. I mean, the origin of existence. Where did the, where did the universe come from? Not, that has nothing to do with evolution, per se. It had nothing to do with Darwin. That's about the evolution of species. Which is ridiculous, too, scientifically speaking, but no, no, it's mathematically flawed. It, no, it, 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 in fact, there's a whole, a whole school of science called information theory that actually completely denies evolution, although they don't say that. But yeah, evo uh, information cannot appear out of nowhere. People see it. All right. So they're coming from a foundational basis before they look at the world, the science, and the data. And that is... The Bible believer believes God exists. The and the evolution believer believes God does not exist. That's it. Uh, no. No, this is a terrible illustration. Even if a person believed, it'd be really hard to believe in a pre-existent universe. But that is not... See, you could bring all kinds of bad baggage with you. you we come to christ as a sinner we're filled with nothing but bad baggage and salvation is based on what believing that christ died on the cross from our for our sins and rose from the dead faith in him and what he did and identifying ourselves with him as as paul says if we believe in our heart that God has raised Jesus Christ from the dead, there's a whole lot of stuff attached to that, that you don't have to understand all of it, and confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, that would normally be associated historically in the church with baptism. There's always been a... Con there, were, there, was not, there was no recorded infant baptisms, but you might be able to squeeze it in there under family baptisms, perhaps. I mean, if, if I had to try to justify that uh, without scripture, twisting Scripture too much, I could probably make a case for it. I don't think it is particularly sound, but you could make a case. But that means you have to understand what people are saying. 
and have a lot of, you know, 46 years and a shelf full of stuff here. So, it, 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 and you do a video, you're going to over uh, simplify things. Otherwise, it'll be 50 hours long. So for over 200 years, the creationists and the evolutionists, they're arguing and debating. There's, there's countless debates on this, by the way. We could jump forward another 200 years. We're, no one's going to gain any ground. Now, I understand. Oh, that's not exactly true. But the, the, First of all, you could, you could be a creationist and not be a Christian. Jehovah's Witnesses are creationists. Jehovah's Witnesses believe in the authority of Scripture, but they're not Christians. So, again, this is conflating things that are not... You're, you're, comp you're trying to compare apples and oranges here. This is not... This is a really bad illustration. I know what he's trying to say. We're coming from a particular view, a foundation of a non-believer and a believer. But that is not that has nothing to do with Calvinism. Mm. <laughs> I sure hope he didn't get some of these ideas from me. There might be um, the occasional atheist or evolution that becomes a Christian and changes their view. I mean, but as a whole... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. We all come to Christ as sinners. Lost sinners that believe in ourselves. We're the center of our own universe. We're all idolaters until we come to Christ. Oh, you have Bible believers that believe the Bible and believe God because they know God exists. And you have the evolution. Oh, no, no, no. A Bible, you can be a Bible believer and know that God exists and go to hell. It's the Pharisees. Most of the Pharisees. Most of the Jews. Because they did not believe in Jesus Christ. They did not receive him as the Messiah and confess him. which is to the Jews being baptized in the name of the Messiah, in the name of Jesus Christ, was to confess that he is the Messiah. Evolutionists who trust in the science. And is it really that they're trusting in the science? Not really. If you really get to the root of it, it's they don't believe God exists. So God exists. Not true. Not true. Again, uh, there's a whole lot of religions in the world, and almost a whole lot of their atheists are, are a minority in the global population. Hindus believe in creation. Buddhists believe in creation. Everybody believes in creation. Even... Atheistic science believes in creation. Out of nothing. X, out of, they believe in creation out of nothing by nothing. Their God is nothing. Quantum fluctuation. But an atheist is just a person that is hostile toward God, like all other sinners are. They're just more clever at it, or more obvious about it. First, God does not exist. Looking at the same science, the same data, they're never going to come together. They're never going to agree because of this foundational difference right here. It's really what it boils down to. And, of course, um, the one is six-day creation. The other is uh, billions of years. Uh, and all because, all because... If you really don't want to know what's going on in this issue... Uh, you need to look at Genesis chapter or Genesis Romans chapter one. Why do they not believe? They know God exists, and they suppress the knowledge of the truth. It's not about data. It's not about science. It's not about foundations. Uh, religious people suppress the truth just as much as non-religious people, which there are no really non-religious people at all. All people have a deity. A lot of them is themselves. So the difference, God exists versus God does not exist, a foundational belief. And I don't know if you noticed that, but if you look closely at the evolution believer, I'm, oops, he's got a frowny face now. 
because he's wrong. <laughs> okay, <laughs> very wrong, and going to be held accountable to that view uh, if he meets his maker still in unbelief. But now, everybody who is not in Christ meets his maker in unbelief. Hmm. Let's look at salvation. It's not about believing in creation. It's about believing in Christ. This is this is a very, very, very bad analogy, and it has nothing to do with Calvinism at all. Salvation. So not the origin of the universe, but now salvation. Now this time we have the Calvinist slash Reformed believer and the Bible believing Christian. And yes, this is not a dichotomy. These are not opposites. Calvin believed the scriptures. All ortho, all Reformed and Presbyterian, all Calvinists are Bible believers. Uh, they might not like your understanding of the Bible, but they believe in the Bible. All the Calvinists, you look in the Westminster Confession of Faith, and it starts with the authority of Scripture. Okay, I, I, I think I should actually show that. Uh, okay, let's go to that. I, I just got, I, I really need to correct this young man, and I hope that some, I haven't given people a false idea about the nature of Calvinism by pointing out problems with it. I don't spend time pointing out what's right with things. That's my background as an engineer, a troubleshooter. Fixed. I don't worry about my car when it's working. I only work on my car when something's not working. Which, like the other day. <sighs> okay, uh, let me see here. What am I trying to do? Where is, oh, I'm, where's my window? There it is. Okay, now I've got to go and go to resources. Westminster Standards. Okay, now let's see if I can get this on the screen. Uh, ad hoc here. Please, thank you. There we go. Of the Holy Scripture, Westminster Confession of Faith by the Order of Parliament. Okay, this is a prescriptive confession. In other words, you believe it or you're a heretic. Because this was a government thing, okay? Actually, this was the parliament who was at war with the king. <laughs> this is complicated. All right, so anyway, it's not that bad. It's I pointed out errors, but they're, the Bible, their proof texts, where it does not prove what they say. But I don't, most of it is fine. I, I guess I need to emphasize that more, but people aren't interested in that anyway. Most of it's fine. In fact, it's like the Baptist, 1689. They just ripped it off because they didn't disagree with most of it. Although the, nature, the light of nature and the works of creation and providence do so far manifests the goodness, wisdom, and power of God as to leave man inexcusable. True, Romans chapter 1, starting at verse 18. Yet are not, uh, they are not sufficient to give the knowledge of God and of his will that is necessary unto salvation. Yes, as Paul says, how can they believe in him whom they have not heard? Someone must proclaim the gospel, or they must read it. They must get the knowledge of the gospel somewhere. That's where the church comes in, proclaiming the gospel. Therefore, it pleased the Lord at sundry times and in diverse manners to reveal himself and to declare uh, that his will, his will unto his church. And afterwards, for the better preserv uh, preserving of the and propagation of the truth, and for the more sure establishment and comfort of the church, 
against the corruption of the flesh and the malice of Satan and of the world to commit the same wholly, entirely, into writing. This lets out the charismatic revelations. Yes, holy, the faith delivered once for all unto the saints, which makes the Holy Scripture to be most necessary, whose former ways of God revealing his will unto his people have now ceased. God is not speaking through uh, new revelation, through spiritual gifts, prophecy, things like that. There are no current apostles. Yes, and then they go into spelling out what are the proper books of the Scripture. I agree with that. Um, it mentions the Apocrypha. They are not divinely inspired, and they have they are useful. I think the the writing of the uh, the books of Maccabees. If you want to understand Daniel, there's a lot of the fulfillment of some of the prophecies in Daniel are recorded in Maccabees, and they're historical but they're not inspired. And the Jews didn't recognize them as inspired. Four, the authority of Holy Scripture for which it ought to be believed. This is, brothers and sisters, this is as Calvinist as you can possibly get, okay? Uh, Calvinists are Bible believers. That this is that's not the pro orthodox not PC USA no they've departed they're apostates uh, though you're going to find apostates everywhere dependeth for which it ought to be believed and obeyed and dependeth uh, dependeth not upon the testimony of any man or church but wholly upon God who is truth itself the author thereof, and therefore it is to be received because it is the word of God. Yes, amen. It doesn't depend on the church, uh, the church of Rome, or some other group or men saying it's true. It, it's God spoke, and therefore it is God's word. And God re declares it to be truth. And the Holy Spirit bears witness to it. We may be moved and induced by the testimony of the church to a high and reverent esteem of the Holy Scripture and the heaviness of the matter and the uh, efficacy of the doctrine and the majesty of the style and the content of all the parts, the scope of the whole, which is to give all glory to God. And that's one thing Calvinism is about, uh, glory of God. Uh, I'm not sure they understand what the glory of God is, but the whole... Actually, there are some foundations to Calvinism that want the, the sovereignty of God and the glory of God are probably uh, the, the emphasize those aspects, but so do all Christians, but they don't necessarily emphasize those as much as certain other things. It's a lot of the differences is, is about emphasis, but then there's just plain old error too. The full discovery of it makes the uh, the only way of man's salvation and many other incomparable excellencies and the entire perfection thereof are arguments whereby it doth abundantly evidence itself to be the word of God, yet notwithstanding our persua full of persuasion and assurance of the, infallible, of the infallible truth and divine authority thereof, is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit, faith on fire. The inward, it is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, who gives us full assurance of the Word of God. So th th this is 100% Calvinism here. Uh, bearing witness by and with the Word in our hearts. And then he goes. it goes on and on, and on, and on about the infallible rule of interpretation is Scripture itself. Sola Scriptura. Now, I, it's not my fault that many Calvinists aren't completely consistent with that. I probably am not either. Who's entirely consistent? Anyway, but to say... 
to, 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 to contrast Calvinists with Bible believers is, is not uh, exactly correct. I just want to point that out. What happened here? Oh, there we go. Some people who are Calvinists out there are going to say, what do the Calvinists believe in the Bible? Many, many of you actually think that you have the only correct interpretation of the Bible. But remember, this is what this is about. So I fundamentally believe, as many others do, that Calvinism is a set of very distinct doctrines that are purely unbiblical. No, that's not Calvinism at all. No. Calvinism may have some influence from some doctrines that aren't biblical. But so do you, I assure you. So do I. If I was aware of them, I'd try to get rid of them. But uh, things creep in unawares. Yes, this is not a, diff a distinction between Calvinist and Bible believing. That is an entirely false position to take. Entirely false. You might say there's a distinction between... You can't even contrast a Bible believing... Christian with a Calvinist. It, it, what? A, a, a Orthodox Calvinist is a Bible-believing Christian. Uh, and I'll, when we get, as we go here, I'll try to deal with some of the issues where he's a little more on point. They're the doctrines of man. They're easily debunked in the Bible, but you'll never convince it. Not so easy as you think. No, not at all. If you know what they're saying, do you understand them? Do you understand where they're coming from? Go read Bovink. He's pretty good. No, you have to understand it. before you. If you want to point out what's wrong with it, you first have to know you understand what they're saying and why they're saying the Calvinist it. Calvinist to that. They're going to look at Romans 9, or they're going to look at Ephesians 1, they're going to look at you know, Romans 8, and they're going to look at that through the lens of their religious belief system and pull out of it the meaning they want, which upholds their doctrine. Mm, not exactly. <laughs> no, the reason they go to those scriptures is because they do provide support. Uh you certainly can support Calvinism from the Scripture. But there are certain passages that don't seem to quite fit. There's other things you can try to support from the Scripture, and there's certain passages like uh, Romans 8 and others that don't quite fit that. So why don't you lay out your doctrine, and we can compare it and see how well that fits the Bible. Uh, no, it's not that simple. There, there is, there, there is a, a uh, I was thinking about this a little bit the other day before this video showed up, and I was thinking that there's an influence that, that leaks into Calvinism through Augustine, through Aquinas, through others. In fact, Aquinas, some of these things, uh, and James Dozal now, uh, classical Christian or classical theism that really goes back to Aristotle. And Aristotle's ideas of God's perfection were wrong. He, of course, he didn't know God at all. He was a pagan, and he just speculating about God anyway. He didn't believe in, a, in, in, in his God because you couldn't believe in the God he speculated if you understand what he's saying. He believed in things like uh, uh, omniscience, omnipotence, sort of. I don't, actually you could say he didn't believe in any of this because his ideas were all based on his idea of perfection, perfection of power, perfection of knowledge. And this God could only know himself. And so basically this hypothetical, hypothetical deity, who certainly wouldn't be a trinity, a biblical God, the biblical God in any way, I certainly couldn't be a creator because he's so absolutely perfect that any change at all would make him less than perfect because he'd be less than what he was. Or if he became more perfect, that meant he wasn't perfect. 
in knowledge, in power. The problem is, the Bible doesn't talk about God's perfection in terms of knowledge and power. I mean, he created all things. You know, power is really sort of irrelevant to God. <laughs> you know, if you define reality, power is not an issue. You know, that's like, hey, I get to write the definitions. I don't have to worry about how much power I have. It's like, I can just create things out of nothing, speak them into existence. I mean, but his moral perfection is what the scripture talks about, not his pagan ideas of perfection. So I think that one of the problems with Calvin was he focused on God's uh, uh, sort of a pagan idea of perfection, his sovereignty, his power to rule in all things, and is, uh, that, that feeds back into... Uh, omniscience and uh, determinism because you have questions how does God know the future well Calvinism is the only one if God exha exhaustively knows the future then the only way for God to do that is to exhaustively determine the future <laughs> and you can wrap that with all kinds of philosophical jargon but that's what it comes down to uh, the Arminian view like the Assemblies of God, for example, where God looks down through the corridors of time. That's BS. James White makes it the perfect case that if God foreknows it, then it is necessarily determined. Otherwise, God would be wrong. Now, it, to have God foreknow exhaustively the future means God has determined exhaustively the future, one way or the other. No way around it. No way around it. <laughs> Unless you believe the future doesn't exhaustively exist yet. Uh, only now exists is what I'd say. The future hasn't happened yet, and the past is already past. It doesn't exist anymore. Only the memory of it exists. So, but I should could be completely wrong. Because the Bible doesn't speculate on these things. It doesn't make any uh, exhaustive, concrete declarations on this stuff. It doesn't. So people are wandering away from what the Bible actually plainly declares. And so, but obviously if you have a debate about it, they're going to look at the same Bible verses, the ones I just referenced, for instance, those chapters. They're going to look at specific Bible verses and just come up with a completely different interpretation. So they are Bible-believing Christians after all, because they look at the Bible and what it says about these things. They do, truly. ...than just the straight-up Bible believer who trusts the Bible without looking it through some special lens designed by a set of doctrines of man. Um... You have lenses too, young man. You just don't know you're wearing them. You ever do that? You got glasses? Where's my glasses? Where? Oh, I've got them on. Yes, you, you've been influenced by other Christians and their ideas. You 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 were not. Uh, you didn't download from God perfect understanding. No. no. Yeah, you, you have your own things. So why will we never come together on this? Well, it's very simple. It's just like before. No, no. First of all, here, here the, the totally false thing here. Calvinist reform versus Bible-believing Christians. This is a really, really bad thing. These are not separate categories. All Orthodox Calvinists reformed are Bible believing Christians. What are you? Orthodox reformed theology holds to the supremacy of Scripture. But like I said, I think there's some other ideas that leaked in from tradition, including theological tradition, Aquinas. That's blowing up Reformed Baptists right now. 
James White is being declared a heretic because he doesn't agree with Aquinas. Who cares about Aquinas? That's what happens when you get off in the weeds. But James White's being persecuted because he wants to hold closer to Scripture. <laughs> oh, good. Maybe I'll see some of the other problems. James White, the foremost apologist for Calvinism on the Internet, I'd say. But you can't say James White's not a Bible believer. You might say he's not understanding some of it correctly, but guess what? So are you and so am I not understanding some of it correctly. <laughs> We're coming from a different foundational place. Bef no, we're not. See, this this is this is where this is this is why this is so bad. And why I'm putting it up here. No, we're not. We're not coming from a different foundation. Some of the interpretation of Scripture has some other ideas. Now, if you hold to dispensationalism, you've got a different. You've got a, a viewpoint that you've been programmed with. If you read Christian books, you're being programmed with a viewpoint. If you read the Bible, your mind is full of other things that affect how you understand what you read. Your, your upbringing, your education, your desires, the fact that you live in a body in which sin dwells affects how you understand God's Word. All these things affect it to the worse, generally. Before we even look at the first Bible verse together, as it pertains to salvation, we're, we're already going to be off. Don't worry about that. We won't get to one, I don't think. And here it is. Uh-oh, that looks like the same, right? Now, you're going to hear Calvinists say that if you don't believe in our definition of God's sovereignty, then you don't believe in God's sovereignty at all. But we all know that that's not true. Every Bible-believing Christian believes in God's sovereignty. And, of course, sovereignty means that he is the creator of all things. No, it means he rules. He's the sovereign. He's the king. He owns all things. He makes up all the rules himself without counseling anybody. True. And he can do anything he wants. Now he is anything he wants. I'm I'm glad he put that character uh, limit in there, because God cannot lie. It's contrary to his nature. Written how he has done things in his word, and so the Bible believers' view of God's sovereignty isn't as rigid as the Calvinists. The Calvinists believe that God created everything, He owns everything, and He knows everything, just like the others. But they add one element to it: determinism. Let's go. Determ okay, all, all, all Christians believe in determinism. God spoke the universe into existence. God determined to create man in his own image. God determined to put tree two trees in the garden. Now, Calvinists, where they go a little off base, biblically speaking, is when they say, uh, Calvin talked about the awful decree of God for Adam to fall. Calvinists explain foreknowledge through determinism, which is the only rational, logical way you can determine you you can explain foreknowledge. It's through determinism. God had to exhaustively decree all things in order to exhaustively know the future in all details. Well, that, that means the future already exists in God's mind, and it can't be changed. And God's, it, God is fully determined, too, by his decree. So some, there's, some of these issues come up if you think about them. However, let me point out that not all Calvinists hold rigidly to that kind of determinism. Some very famous ones, like um, Francis Schaeffer, Calvinist, 
Reformed philosopher had a a view that allowed for uh, human bounded human freedom, and the biblical text can be interpreted a number of different ways and still be what the Bible says. Now, what he's talking about is exhaustive determinism. Uh, James White. James White is not a typical Calvinist. R.C. Sproul, although he didn't deny this, he didn't emphasize it. Uh, Spurgeon was a Calvinist, a staunch Calvinism, Calvinist. But his Calvinism wasn't front and center. That was the background, not the main thing. Uh, he was more concerned with the gospel. He didn't have to fit everything into the London Baptist 1689 Confession. God chose everything that's going to happen already from the beginning of time. He determined every action and that of course relating to salvation. Okay, even with Calvin, okay, you've got maybe a chapter or two in this book. That is not the emphasis of Calvin, nor was it of Luther. But Luther was even more of an Augustinian determinist than Calvin. Luther was a pastor. Calvin was a pastor. That was more important than others. Uh, but you know how people are? They like man's writing more than God's writing. You know, it's easier to deal with Calvin than it is the Bible because this really, you can take it or leave it and it doesn't really affect you because it's only the opinions of a man. This is Calvin's opinion. Some of Calvin's opinion. He has a lot more opinion than this. It's not that bad. Now, this was Calvin's, Calvin's attempt to understand how God knows the future. How, and really what it gets down to is, is why is, does one person believe and another person not? Can you answer that question? And if you say free will, why does one person freely choose Christ and another one freely reject? Christ. I, I can quickly get to the point where you can't answer the question. And that's the deal. It's attempt, Calvin's attempt to explain why some are saved. Well, Paul deals, spends like three chapters in Romans on this very issue. Why, are, why is some of Israel saved, but not all of Israel saved? And it's not a simple answer at all. But Calvinism is an attempt to answer that question. I, it falls short because God, there's mystery in God. And this is a mystery. Why one person will receive Christ and another one won't. And to throw up free will doesn't really answer the question at all. Doesn't. Determinism does, but then why is anybody accountable for their sin? See, both answers fall short. We can ask Christ when we see him. But we have to keep this in mind. That's the difference between attempts of human beings to understand God's Word. And, you know, we don't have to know these answers. It's like the cross. Exactly what happened on the cross uh, with the relationship with the Son and the Father. I mean, those things can be—those are more important, really— where you have the idea of the father pouring out his wrath on the son, is like the scripture doesn't really support that idea at all because it was the father who sent him to die on the cross. 
So it's misinterpretations and distortions where we get these problems. Okay, so which is what's going on here, misinterpretation and distortion. It's a very difficult subject, and Calvinism, I mean, I, it took me a couple of years to I really got a handle on it, and I understood what was going on and what was underneath. And I'm a person that's analytical. I mean, I, that's how I have to do I have to understand something. I work on the car, i got to understand it. Why is it acting the way it is? What could be causing that? I don't just start changing parts. I didn't change the muffler because the engine was acting up. Includes who will be saved and who will not be saved from the beginning of time because of their... Right. And that... I I've gone through that and the Westminster Confession of Faith because it's a you know it's an official document and compared it to the scriptures and demonstrated that it doesn't the scriptures don't actually say what they're saying. That was a misuse of scripture. In fact, they didn't even look in the Bible. They created the creed and then the parliament told them to go back and get scriptural proof for it. They probably would, the committee probably said, "I wish you would have told that when you ordered the thing in the first place." Now we got to paste some proof text on it. We didn't go to the Bible to find this stuff out. We got it from tradition, from Augustine, from Aquinas. We can't expect, even the reformers, Luther, I've, I've come to appreciate more on this recently. Um, Luther the pastor, I mean, th these were fall fallible Christians struggling in a very hostile environment, struggling to break free from a thousand years of Roman Catholicism. And all those traditions and all that education that was dumped into them You know, having a discussion with a conservative Lutheran minister and talking about uh, this sacramentology and the, the bread and, you know, it's like, and we were talking out of the Bible, both of us. He was wrong, but... Uh, but I can see his point of view. But I also know he's bound to some tradition. And he couldn't disagree with that position with that tradition and stay there as pastor. <laughs> he's, he's, uh, I have the freedom to, to say, no, I don't have to protect my job. A grossly mi sad misinterpretation of Ephesians 1 about the foundations of the world and some other passages too. Uh, can those passages be interpreted in a Calvinistic way? Yes, they can. They can, especially if that's what you believe is the truth. You will see them at, at, through a Calvinist lens. Just like if you're a free willer, you will see them through a free will lens. The trick is, how do we understand them the way God understands them? Oh, there's the issue right there. But notice I put delegation over here. What does that mean? Punt. I punt on that one. Subject to a... Oh, my. A separate uh, video will be made to explore in Scripture all the various ways in which God delegated authority to mankind. Ah! What do you mean by delegated? Now let me let me point out something. When I saw this, I thought, eh. Um, God said, "Let." He said, when he talking about creating Adam, let us ha let man rule over the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea and uh, whatever, and give the you know, the dominion rule over these things. Now, who did he delegate authority to? 
man as a sinner or man as unfallen? Did God did God give the uh, turn? You know, it's like a police officer. Did did God turn over the loaded weapon to Adam the sinner, or the loaded weapon to Adam sinless? The intention to give authority to rebels. I don't think so. Adam the rebel, let me give him authority. No, he stripped him of his powers, including the power to eat from the tree of life, and drove him out of the garden, didn't he? Adam was defrocked, deauthorized. And he lost freedom, freedom of will, too, because he became a slave of sin, a slave of the devil. So there's uh, subject to accountability of God's laws. Um, no, the law didn't exist yet other than the law that do not eat that tree. No, there, there was no. Um, the law of Moses appeared somewhat later, like 2,500 years later including the law of faith in Romans 3.27. Oops. No, no, no. Faith is not a law you must obey. Uh, Romans 3.27. We've got to look at that. Excuse me. we got to look at that. Let's see. Where is my window? Uh Okay, I know the passage he's referring to. Romans 3. No, it's it's not a law like the law of Moses. Where is boasting then? Is is it is excluded by what law? Of works? Nay, by the law of faith. What's the law of faith? That in Christ Jesus, we're no longer under the law of Moses. We're simply under that that the, the law, God's ordina, ordained that salvation would be by faith, not by works. That's the law of faith. God's or rule, His or decree that salvation will be through faith and not through works. What does that have to do with the Calvinist Bible believer <laughs> distinction? Nothing. Nothing at all. Uh, what else? Okay, there. God's sovereignty means this. As I said, he created it all. He owns it all. And he is aware of all things. I'm not an open theist. I don't believe God's wondering what's going to happen in the future. I believe he knows everything. No, God's not wondering about what's happened in the future. What did Jesus say? Give no concern for tomorrow. No, there is, the future does not exist until it happens. What God has decreed will happen, will happen. What God has, has prophesied will absolutely happen. Absolutely happens. Exactly in what way? I don't know. One of the things with uh, the issues with Calvinism and non-Calvinism inside Christianity is how has God chosen to exercise his sovereignty, his rule over all things? Especially with human beings created in his own image. Do, you know, and then fallen human beings who no longer really bear his image, but are still bear the purpose, the obligation to be his image. I, I, I've yet to hear a good explanation how sinful fallen human beings retain the image of God, like what? The holy, the righteous, the, the, the love, you know, what, uh, what attributes of God do they still possess? That are that makes them the image of God. Other than the obligation to be the image of God, because that was their created purpose to be the image of God. Let us make man in our own image, and to rule. Now, obviously, 
they lost that ability, didn't they? They got kicked out of the garden and put under a curse. And uh, you'll, from now on, you're going to have to sweat it. Eat your bread by the sweat of your brow. Ain't going to be easy. <laughs> Everything from the beginning to the end, I think that's what the Word of God clearly says. And I know there's some that may slightly disagree with that and but i firmly believe god knows everything that's going to he knows who's going to be saved he knows who's not going to be saved but he didn't determine it well that's not possible i don't think i can't see a way that that's possible how can god know who's going to be saved and who won't be saved individually before they even exist, unless he determines it. There's no future. There is no future to know. There's nothing there. Because things only exist in the present. There is no future until the, the future is now. Have you noticed that? And you can't go into the future other than the same speed everybody else is. The future is what has not happened yet. It has not happened. I don't think it's just like, you know, some people, God can know. Can God know a round circle? Since God defines everything that exists, can he know what he hasn't defined? Because there's nothing there to know until he conceives of it until he brings it into existence. At least in his mind. It's like, nah. No, I, I, I'm not an open theist. I, don't, I believe God is totally so, uh, sovereign, and God totally knows all that is knowable, including what he's going to do, uh, has, de has decreed he's going to do. But exactly... I don't see a reason to believe in a total exhaustive determinism of all things other than if you believe that God exhaustively knows the future. Yeah, I think you have to go with determinism if you believe that. I don't believe in an open future. God knows the end from the beginning. The, the end, what is that? Heaven or hell? That's the end. He knows that if he doesn't save you, where you're going. You're on the Broadway Unless he rescues you from the broad way and puts you on the narrow way, where does the narrow way go? And with, with salvation, eternal life. Where does the broad way go? Destruction. You're born into the broad way. Child of Adam. God has to save you from that way into the narrow way. That end is, both ends are determined from the beginning. You stay on that road, that's where you're going to end. Does God have to determine exactly what you're going to cook for breakfast? There's no reason. There is a place for human will. Otherwise, we're not, we have nothing in the image of God at all. We're not, we're not even, even animals have their own will. I know my dog. <laughs> she will do what she wants. She has a will, and she shows it now and then. It's like, no, I don't want to come in here. No, she's human beings, how much more so? If we were created in God's image, then you're going to, to say that we have no will is to say God has no will. I mean, that's ridiculous. Uh, that those would be things that, that, we, that were not lost completely, yet we became slaves of sin. Uh, a slave cannot like where they are and can be desired to be free, but that doesn't mean they can free themselves. And it's it's not that I want to use the word free will or choice or anything like that. Sure, we could use this, but it's more along this line. What does the Bible say? The Bible tells us that God delegated authority to mankind. No, it said what? You have to read it a little more carefully.
each and every one of us is going to be held accountable for our decisions. God has provided everything we need to know. Not all our decisions. Okay. And it's not simply a matter of knowledge. God, you're not going to be held accountable for what you cook for breakfast, okay? Not relevant. It's not relevant. It really isn't. What is... If you do not understand that you are a slave of sin and that it is absolutely necessary for God to intervene. And you will not be saved unless, you will not come to Christ unless the Father draws you. Okay. There, there is a mystery in that, that dance of salvation where God is absolutely essential. He initiates it, but I, I think there's some place in, well, John chapter 1, where he says, all those who receive him, in other words, you acknowledge him, you believe he's the Christ, he's the Messiah, or for Christians, he's, he's, he rose from the dead. To them, and you're justified because of that, you believe into righteousness. Uh, he gives you the authority to become the sons of God. If you have the authority, you can choose to exercise it or not exercise it. That's the nature of authority. You, you are the one who chooses whether or not to use that power. You're not compelled. Otherwise, it wouldn't be authority. That is not, dele uh, it's not exactly the same as delegation. Uh, you have that authority because God gave it to certain people. Those who receive him, receive Christ. So there is a the Bible does say something, and we're accountable for that. Judgment will be on the basis of whether or not you believe in Christ. Search the New Testament. Not on the basis of the law of Moses. After all, there was an atonement for the whole human race, for sin, period. All sin in Christ. He bought you. Out from he bought everybody out from underneath that, and judgment is now as God determined, not on the basis of works, but on the basis of faith in Christ. That's the law of faith. Oh, to know what his rules are, he's given us all the commandments. We no one is saved through the law. No one is saved through the law. By the works of the law shall no flesh be justified, for, th for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Either obey and believe it, or we reject it. And the people who reject it, the Calvinist side believes that God determined them to do so. That's why they're not the elect. Well, okay, some of the Calvinist side. Some. Uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith surely does. The London Baptist, Second London Baptist Confession, says that too. Yes, double predestination. Although they might frame it in God passed over the others. God elects people to save. Yes, he is under no, condi uh, no obligation to elect everybody. He has made his existence known to all, and he proclaims the gospel in all the world. Or he's doing that now. How you respond to that, yeah. That, but God's under no obligation to save convicted sinners, rebels. He's under, under no obligation to give everybody the same opportunity or the same knowledge. He's not. You're guilty. You're under the sentence of death already. You're going to go to hell. But they had no option, no choice, because they weren't delegated any authority like the Bible believing believing Christian uh, sees in the Bible. So this is the foundational difference between, say... No, this is the foundational difference between <clears throat> Calvinistic Baptists and Free Will Baptists. Calvinism 
and Bible. If you're starting at a point of God's sovereignty determined everything, so everything is already in the will of God, whether it's good. Yeah, so the, uh, I suspect he's been listening to me, okay? Exhaustive determinism, yes. That, that I have a real issue with exhaustive determinism. <sighs> Calvin pretty well held to that, although not with the clarity that some hold to it. Yes, if God determined utterly... Now, let me put make a point here. One can argue, let's go back to the Westminster Confession of Faith, and let's go to eternal decree. Okay. Now, if I wanted to defend the eternal decree, can I do it? Where is my window? Okay, here. Okay, the eternal decree of God, chapter 3 of the Westminster Confession of Faith. God from all eternity did by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass. That's the exhaustive eternal decree. Yet so, okay, let me say that as long as you let the let so's stand as limiting the first clause. Say that this is how I'd approach a Bible believing, a brother in Christ that was a Calvinist and believed in the Westminster Confession of Faith. Okay, so they recognized there was a problem with what they were saying. So they put it, you know, so the question is, is this next clause a limiting clause? Limits the first statement. So I would I would tell a Calvinist, if so, if you are limiting the first statement by this and saying there's a mystery in God we don't understand. This is our our basic explanation, but there's something missing here because you can't follow. If you just take that first clause, you've got God being the author of all wickedness. And I put that out there and I and say, yeah, that's what the logical implications are. The question is, the Calvinist, if you're a Calvinist and you want to defend that, you have to come back and say, you have to explain why that can be without God being the author of sin and not just throw up your hands and say, that's a mystery. No, here's how you do it. I've given you all help here. Yet so, as thereby neither is God the author of sin. Okay, so if you limit that first one, by that. So God is not the author. Calvin's explanation sucked, okay? He didn't have a good explanation. He doesn't even try. He just says, yeah. Uh, There's all kinds of ways that they try to get around it. You just have to limit the first clause by these words. Yet so, as thereby neither is God the author of sin, nor is violence done to the will of creatures. God forcing your will, changing your will, without that's not it. Uh, nor is the liberty or contingency of second clauses taken away, but rather established. Okay, if you allow these three clauses, let's see, wait, one, two, three, yeah, three clauses to stand as limiting the first clause, there's really no problem here. But I do know Calvinists don't let those three clauses typically to stand. James White ignores those three clauses. Because trying to hold all those together and understand them, there's a problem. <laughs> okay, so here, because of what the rest of the, the problem is, uh, the what the rest of the Westminster Confession does about the decree of salvation and everything else, it sort of means these three clauses are moot. But if you let these three clauses stand, then that eternal decree is not a problem. 
but you can't let them to stand because they nullify the first clause. Really? Uh, so it's it's uh, double speak. <laughs> uh, see, like here here he talks about for all for God knows what soever may or can come to pass under all supposed circumstances. That's a very important word there. See, they don't really believe there's supposed. There's no counterfactuals, really. I mean, in God, how can there be counterfactuals? God has options and he chooses the options. How can God who makes all things out of nothing have options? I mean, this is this is a really a a I think an on biblical idea of God. Uh oh, see, we, we think of God in human terms, regardless of trying not to. We have options. God doesn't have options. Yet hath he not decreed anything because he foresaw it as future. See, that's, um, this was written after Arminius. Or as which would come to pass upon such conditions. In other words, God does not predict the future. He does not look down into the future. It's based on his eternal decree. Now, how do you fit? The problem, there's a lot of problems with this idea of the eternal decree. Most Calvinists avoid the whole issue. I've had discussions with Calvinists in the past, years past, where you're talking to them and, you, you know, they're, they're five-point Calvinists. They believe in the five points of Calvinism. They don't know what the root of it is. And I didn't either. But, you know, like you bring up the eternal decree and they'll say, I don't believe in that. So there's all kinds of Calvinists. So it's this is talking about, see, here they're going way beyond Scripture. Now, this is only a small part of the Westminster Confession, talking about why people, some people are saved and why others aren't. Just stay bounded by Scripture, and you won't get yourself into trouble. Uh, in fact, the last thing they say, I can't scroll that up there. I'll have to read it to you. Uh, eight here. Maybe I can get it over. My head's in the way. That's a problem. This is what they say about the doctrine of predestination at the end of the section on the eternal decree. This do uh, The doctrine of this high mystery of predestination is to be handled with special prudence and care that men attending the will of God uh, revealed in his word and yielding obedience thereunto may, from uh, the certainty of their effectual vocation, their effectual calling, be assured of their eternal election. This is the Presbyterian view of once saved, always saved. Or as they would say, uh, the perseverance of the saints. Because God chose you, God will continue his good work in you. I mean, this, this is, there's plenty of scripture for this. You know, he that began a good work uh, in you will bring it to completion. So th this really, where Calvinism gets in his trouble, is, is speculating about how God knows things, how he... Uh, knows the future, uh, why some people are saved and when some people aren't. If they just that they would just stick with what Paul writes, and not trying to fix what Paul says, they would avoid difficulties. But it says right here. Uh, so th th they're saying that this doctrine. Well, it's like Paul talks about in Romans nine. He that called you, also, uh, he that uh, what. Uh, where is this? He, who, whom he foreknew, he also called, and whom he called, he also justified, and whom he justified, he also glorified. That's what, and Paul's, all this is about God's faithfulness, having begun his work in you, will bring it to completion. He's, he's, 
Paul is talking there in that chapter of Romans about how great God's saving ability is. That's his point. And that's what they're trying to say here. Uh, after they, they, they basically shoot themselves in the foot in seven up here. But here they're sort of admitting that this is dangerous. They, they, are, they are pushing things pretty far. Uh, ten, okay, uh, so they, they might know the, uh, the certainty of their effectual vocation. Well, how can you ever know whether your vocation is effectual or not? This is a man-made document. That's why it is not uh, Scripture. Uh, and be assured of their eternal election. Well, say the, the Puritans, they obsessed about these very ideas. So shall this doctrine afford uh, a matter of praise, reverence, and admiration of God and of humility, diligence, and abundant consolation to all that sincerely obey the gospel. Okay, see, this is, this is, you know, they say, this has to be handled carefully because it's toxic. It is, because they know very well that what they're really doing is, uh, well, blaming God for everything. <laughs> that's a problem. That's a, that's a how, do, how do you avoid that? Well, don't go there. Most Calvinists tend to avoid talking about this too much wisely some don't and they do things like ask whether God ordained the rape of a child and their answer is yes otherwise it would have no meaning really no it'd be a demonstration of sin and rebellion against God that has meaning demonstrate sin and rebellion God didn't decree it I mean see this is a problem where You've got us. This goes back to to Aristotle's idea of God's perfection. That God, <clears throat> the perfect knowledge. God cannot learn anything. Uh, actually, God can't have a relationship with anything either. God can't create anything either. See, Arist uh, the uh, people like Augustine and Aquinas. Aquinas tried to syncretize blend together and reconcile Aristotle with Roman Catholicism. That was his mission, really. You can't. Well, you might be able to do it with Roman Catholicism, but you can't do it with biblical Christianity. Uh, you can't. You can't. Because Aristotle was a pagan and did not know God. He did not know the Scriptures even, and his idea of perfection was from a sinful human being's point of view. Uh, whereas the scripture, when it talks about God's perfection, it's about his moral perfection, much more so. And the, the getting that wrong, putting the, the you could say, the power of perf perf uh, perf perfection of God above his moral perfection ends up with this. This is the uh, the worst part of Calvinism. This was the unbiblical part. that it, You can try to make it biblical, but it doesn't work very well because there are too many... Poor, you know, James White, when he justifies Calvinism, he's got certain select passages he goes to, and that's all the place you're allowed to go. You're not allowed to go to Romans chapter 10 or John chapter 1. <clears throat> because that wouldn't serve jo James White's purpose. He's an evangelist for Calvinism, or was. I don't know what he is now. <laughs> now he's just in, in trouble trying to defend himself against Aquinas. But see, that that's... Uh, uh, that's really the issue. If you if you were to take their statement on the eternal decree and allow those other clauses to limit it, then it's not nearly so much of a problem because that limits it in such a way that he is not the author of sin 
and that he does not do violence to free will, and that he establishes these things rather than contradicts them. Okay, show me the Calvinist can actually do that. <laughs> How that does that. Obviously, the, the Westminster divines must have, been, must have been divine if they understood it. I don't think so. I mean, I've struggled with this for 46 years. And you end up with what? You end up with there's something. God has a free will. But it's limited. God's free will is not absolutely free. God has to. God is limited by his moral nature. God cannot lie, for example. His moral nature limits what God can do. He's not absolutely infinite, unbounded. He is bounded by himself, what he is, his moral nature, especially. That what that's what the Christian concept of God has much more to do with that than his the 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 the, very fa the, the fact that he is the creator. You know that he, the powers. You know the one that defines everything uh, doesn't define himself. Because he is God, he's not. He he does not redefine himself. He just is what he is. And the, the things about power and uh, omnis omniscience and omnipotence, omnipresence, these are really not nearly as important as his moral attributes. That God is truth. He is justice, holiness. Uh, righteousness again; these are sort of they all overlap. Uh, love, mercy, grace, uh, wrath at times. I mean, wrath and love are connect together. The question is, what does God love? Who does God love? These are all abused, but they're all God. That that these are just words we use to describe the being of God. And the the other attributes of power are pretty much uh, the incommunicable attributes they're called are not the primary ones. Other, he's just God. That makes him different than us, but that's it's not that's not moral attributes. Those are those are bounded. Even those attributes, how he how he exercises his sovereignty, his power is determined by his moral attributes. How does God exercise the fact that he is sovereign over all things? How is he chosen to do that? And creation limits that too. Having created man in his own image, having created at all, does affect God and his knowledge. Otherwise, you end up with a real mess. And when you talk about these, you probably make mistakes. I am probably making a lot of mistakes right now. But I'm trying. All right, so this is uh, one of these things that is, you know, it, this, this, this whole setting, Calvinist Reformed Christianity, Calvinist reform Bible believing Christianity against Bible believing Christianity is is no this is different what the, really what underlies this is the question that Paul's dealing with in Romans 8 and 9 and and 10 and 11 why are why is some of Israel saved or some people saved and others aren't and the Calvin's answer was the eternal decree Calvinism's, uh, the Westminster Confession's answer is the eternal decree of God. Um, that's only one possible answer. Now, the Scripture makes it very clear that because we are responsible, but God has chosen to shut all under sin, so that gets... You cannot hold a person responsible when they could not have done other. So we are. We have moral responsibility. We can choose to not do things, for example. 
even though we can't do, a sinner cannot do anything that is good, truly good, because the, the fact is you are a sinner and God is not dwelling in you. You are not being the image of God, therefore you cannot fulfill your purpose. And the fact that you've sinned, or, uh, you've sinned has radically, or Adam's sin has radically affected you. You need a radical salvation. And that has to be God, because you cannot possibly save yourself. But when you push things too far beyond the biblical bounds, you get into a mess. Good, whether it's evil, it doesn't matter. Whatever happens, God determined it. If you're start, starting from that. Sounds like he's been listening to me. <sighs> yes, because if God exhaustively determines all things and you leave those those limiting clauses off, um, yeah, the, 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 the exhaustive decree of all things, that's where you run into a problem. And most Calvinist theologians do a little dance at times. Um, because you have to. We simply don't have... There is a mystery here. At least Lutherans have enough sense to say, this is a mystery. We don't have the answers. God has revealed all things to us. We're not God. But God is just and holy and true. And God... See, here's another problem where the Scripture says, clearly says, contrary to James White, and uh, and who is the... Uh, the Baptist character, the, the Congregationalist, uh, the, the death of death and the death, uh, John Owen, uh, which is not a very good book either. The Scripture clearly says, Paul writes to Timothy, that, that God is, desires the salvation of all. God is inclined toward the salvation of all men. That's the dif difference between saying God determinatively decrees or wills to save all men. So there, there is, but the scripture does say that. It doesn't say that, that or it talks about Jesus dying for the sins of the whole world. That is scripture. It does actually say that. And trying to twist the original language to make it not say that so it fits your theology is sinful. We have to be able to say there's a mystery. We don't fully understand all things, and God hasn't fully re revealed all things. God has revealed to us what is necessary for salvation. Actually, more than what is necessary for salvation. I mean, there's, there's some books in the Bible you really don't need to read. Um, like Job. <laughs> you know, it, it, there's not that there's things you can't learn from it. It's just... Mm. Um, in fact, maybe if you're a free willer, you should read Job. We don't, as sinners, we don't have a free will. As a born-again believer, we're no longer a slave of sin. So, But before you're born again, you are a slave of sin. Uh, a slave, I mean, I think you could, you have, a sinner has the power to call out to God for salvation out of their own selfish interest. But they have to call out to be saved from sin, to be saved from the judgment of God. Not to be saved from difficulties and other things. People generally don't want to be saved from their sin. They love their sin. That's the problem. But God has to intervene. And Yes, it's when Calvinism goes to an extreme, but most of what is in Calvinism is just fine. It needs to be subordinated to the Scripture. All things have to be subordinated to the Scripture. All confessions and creeds. There's problems with all of them because they're not Scripture. They're not God's Word. They're not inspired by God. Calvin wasn't inspired by God. Luther was not inspired. His words were not inspired by God. Both of them could get downright nasty. Uh, Wesley, I mean, Wesley could be vile. I mean, some of the things he did for somebody that you know that that talks about 
sinless perfectionism. Wesley certainly didn't meet that. Point, you're going to read the Bible quite differently than the one who believes mankind is accountable for their actions because... No, Calvinists believe mankind is accountable for their actions too. How do they explain that? They don't very well. God delegated us authority, but he sets the rules. So we're accountable to those. No, so, so you're quickly getting into legalism here. This is dangerous. We're account People will be condemned for not believing in Christ. John 3, 36. The, whether or not you belong to Christ is the basis of the judgment. There's rules. And when the Bible says... that That's why uh, Christ dying for the sins of the entire world is important because it, it takes everybody out from under law and puts you under Christ. So Christ's atonement is sufficient, as Calvinists say. Okay, let me... Because you're talking a whole... Now, I, I use the Westminster Confession of Faith because it's just... It's it's an official thing. But it doesn't apply to all Calvinists. Calvinists don't have to accept it unless you're in a Presbyterian church that holds to it and requires it. Not many of those around. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, but no, this, this is... What was I going to say? Uh, now I forgot. But this, this is just a mischaracterization. Uh, the, the entirety of uh, Calvin, uh, other than a, a few errors that are not fundamental to salvation. See, what, how you believe, this is, these are ideas about what God does as God behind the scenes, which is really none of our business. We're not, well, you know... A little child can trust in their father, but they don't have to know how their father does his job. My father was in business management and accounting, and I didn't know that stuff. I, I've still never figured out accounting, really. It's like, what's his debits and credits, and why are they backwards, and how does it work across accounts and everything? Like, ah, let me set it up my own way. But, see, I didn't, to be his son, I didn't have to know what he knew and how he did it. I just had to know he was my father. And trusting him, you know. He, he knew how to balance the budget. I didn't have to know how to balance the budget. And, see, unless you come to me as a little child, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. That's... If you have to understand everything first, you're not going to get in. Because you're not going to understand it all. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. That is a commandment. God. True, it's an imperative. However, see, th this is not what separates Calvinism. Calvinism believes this. Calvinists believe this. Except for some really weird ones. Um, primitive Baptists and some of the other Baptist cults in England that are, they're, they are truly hyper-Calvinists. Uh, most Calvinists would say, well, you know, this isn't really the main point, and we really can't explain it, and so, like, we don't talk about it too much. But then you got people like James White, who just should shut up, you know, uh, because uh, now... R.C. Sproul, for example, I've heard him talk about this, but this is certainly not R.C. Sproul's main thing. Or, or Charles Spurgeon, he was he, he was a Calvinist. He held to the 1689 London Baptist Confession or a, 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 a thing of it. I think he had his own little updated language. But he held to these ideas as a system of theology in the background, man's theology, um, because he thought it explained things pretty well. But th that's not what he preached. He preached Christ and Christ crucified. He preached the gospel. He didn't preach Calvinism. It was only incidental. And if you 
put too much infl- uh, influences on it. Now, you're talking about Calvinists. You're, you're talking about uh, high Calvinism, Calvinism, like in the Westminster Confession of Faith. You, and there's people that go way beyond that. There are truly hyper-Calvinists. That, that's, all, that's all they talk about is that. Uh, th- th- that the eternal decree and they're not Christians. Those people aren't Christians. It's not. There's no place for Christ in that theology at that point. And I've mentioned that if you, when you push it, when the eternal decree becomes all things, lo- and I, I'm often talking about the logical implications. Now people aren't really logical. <laughs> so you you can even James White will talk about this too. Uh, uh, Merci- divine inconsistent or in, uh, merciful in, mercifully inconsistent you know you don't have to be consistent because you don't know the the truth really uh, god is too big for you to comprehend that's mean we can't know him it's like i didn't comprehend my father's work even to this day it's like accounting trying to read an accounting book and it's like this is weird they're conventions. They're, they're arbitrary conventions often. And to watch him, fly, his fingers fly over a mechanical uh, computing machine. Um, it was amazing to me as a kid, even as a young adult, watching him run a calculator. He was just over here, just his fingers just flying away. Like, I can't do that. <laughs> But I don't need to. He was my father. It had nothing to do with that stuff. I didn't have to understand my dad entirely. I, I didn't have to comprehend him. I don't comprehend myself. He was just, it was a relationship. A Calvinist, you can hold to to a, a, a theological system uh, that even has serious flaws in it here and there. Calvinism isn't seriously flawed. It just, if you take this one section and you make too much of it, rather than putting it in the closet and locking it away, <laughs> yeah, treat it like kryptonite. Uh, wrap, put it in a, a lead container and seal it away and then lock it in a vault someplace and then it won't trouble you. Uh, just go out with it. But because it's trying to explain what God does hidden behind the scenes. You don't know. You don't know. Admit you don't know. Lutherans do that. It's a mystery. Or at least they should. That's their bailout. It's a mystery. You can abuse that, too. But no, this is this is simply, and, and I'm afraid I may have misled some people by pointing out the flaw and focusing on that, because why well, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna bother going through 99% of this book. Because it's not a problem. <laughs> okay, or or Bovink. I mean, I like Bovink. Because most of Bovink isn't about these things. And Bovink had enough sense to to not go some places too. But I'm talking about like the incarnation. I mean. I mean, uh, Calvinists don't try to explain, you know, it's like, ah, no, that's really getting in an area we just can't uh, talk about because we don't know. But, yeah. Uh, Put it in the Bible for a reason. And a number of different ways we could read over and over and over again with a great promise that whosoever believeth that shall be saved. Whoever. Uh, yeah, but, see, th- this young man here is ignoring the scriptures, there's scriptures on both sides. There, and you, you, if you have, if you look at all of scripture, there's no way. Uh, yeah, you could take the promises, whoever believeth, that's true. But the problem you're not understanding is Calvinism tries to explain why some believe and some don't. They're, they're, they're really going to the outer limits when they do that. I mean, it's, it's. Uh, it's trying to explain God. <laughs> uh, yeah, and our human beings. I mean, there's some element in us 
that has to do with us being made by God, and we have a will, and we are morally responsible, and if you, but you can, we don't have a free will. Not even God has an absolutely free will. God is bounded by his moral nature. We are, as a sinner, you are enslaved by your, your sin. And I'm afraid this young man doesn't really understand the gospel in some ways. Because when you start talking about free moral agency and we're accountable, you quickly become a legalist. The Bible says, God also says God shut all under sin that he might show mercy to all. There's something that, see, Calvinists ignore texts that doesn't fit into their system, their model. Other people do the same thing with their systems of theology. Your system of theology can't accept all the biblical data because it's created by limited men and women. It can't accept the testimony of Scripture in totality because it's not inspired by God. It's not capable. whoever believes in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, of course. So here we have delegated authority, determinism, and if I may, uh, got to give... Again, here, here comes, what does it mean to believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? See, if you, if you start asking questions below superficial statements, it quickly becomes confusing and complicated. And you end up quickly, God, God, well, that's God does it, God's business. Why does one person believe and another doesn't? You cannot find the answer simply in fallen. Why does a sinner, why, do some, why are some sinners saved and some aren't? If you understand the, the difficulty with sin and that you're not free, you're a slave of sin. I mean, at some point, you have to, God determines. God chooses people. God elects people. And the Scripture is very clear about that. And it is God who saves us. We don't save ourselves. It's not, our choice doesn't save us. God brings us to a point where, where we do choose him, but it's all because of what God does. And I, I have to go back to John chapter 1 where he says, all that receive him who, re who will uh, acknowledge him for who he is, believe on him, to them he gives the authority. There is a certain element of choice uh, that is given to us by God. I can't imagine why somebody would not exercise that authority, but, but uh, God hasn't revealed all the details. doesn't have to. We're saved by faith, not by knowledge a frowny face to the Calvinists because they're wrong. Just like the creationist and evolutionist debate, but one of them's wrong. One believes God exists, the other believes God does not exist. No, see, that, that, was, that was a false contrast, too, as I pointed out. You know, th this, is, this is simply bad. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an invalid comparison of salvation. You've got one this Calvinism is simply attempting to answer the unanswerable. Why is one person saved and another person not? And they go back to an eternal decree. You can make a biblical case, but there's other things in the Bible that it doesn't really fit into that model. And you can make a case the other way, but there's things in the Bible that don't fit into that model. In other words, our understanding of Scripture is not sufficient. It is not complete. That could be because God is God and we are not. We are limited, especially in these bodies. When we see him as he is, we'll understand better. But no, I mean, this is, this is the problem here, and we... We should not mischaracterize what other people are trying to say, uh, especially when, I mean, you, you can't call a Calvinist a non-believer, a non-believer unless they actually are. 
I mean, there are some Calvinists that are so far out that they are non-Christians. They are simply determinists. And, uh, and again, there are people like that, but they're about as common as hen's teeth. teeth. Uh, some primitive Baptists where they don't believe that person has to hear the gospel at all. But the scripture clearly says he does. That's why they're taking a portion of a theological system and making that determine how they understand all scripture. You have to be aware. You have to be careful with theology that it doesn't completely replace scripture, or it's going to color your understanding anyway. It's unavoidable. You hold a set of beliefs, especially if they're not something that is plainly revealed in the Bible, and even what is plainly revealed, what you already think and believe and your ideas affect how you understand that. The language you're using, your vocabulary, your understanding of words, all this plays in. Fortunately, that doesn't save us. God saves us. Otherwise, it's like nobody's going to be saved. So, no, this is a false distinction. Now, the idea that, that Calvinists aren't Christians is basically what he's saying. Or that people that believe in evolution aren't Christians. They don't believe in God. That's not true. That's not... Though you're, you're, you're putting apples and oranges together. They're different things. Be more careful. Think caref more carefully. And I, I would apologize to everybody out there if I have given people wrong ideas because I focus on the problem. Why would I focus on what's right? That's somebody else's job. And she, like, like, uh, like I said, my, my vehicle, as long as everything's working, I'm not worried about it. I don't focus on that. It's errors when Calvinism goes astray and when people become obsessed with things like the eternal decree. As I said, just put it in a lead container, lead line container because it's radioactive, and put it away someplace and don't worry about it. Just say, that's a mystery. That's God's business, not my business, to, to tell why. Other than what clear, a scripture clearly uh, talks about, that is faith in Christ is necessary. God's grace is, we are saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Without God's grace, there is no salvation. Without you believing in Christ, there is no salvation. And it's not of works that no man should boast. Salvation is of the Lord. It's a gift. And not everyone receives that gift. And don't try to explain it. You'll end up frying your brain and eventually throw your hands up and say, oh, I don't know, because that you don't. So uh, I would like to apologize to, to all the people out there if I have misled people into thinking that Calvinism is not Christianity, because it's not, it's not a true statement. There are, there are Calvinists that aren't Christians, but there are. And there's Calvinists that go too far, as, you know, like James White does. Um, he's a, a high, well, he's like a borderline hyper-Calvinist. Um, although real hyper-Calvinism, you would not, I'm not, I'm not even going to bother with that, because it's not, you hardly ever run into him. I have, but those are, Total determinists. That's all that, that matters. God just does what he wants. The gospel is not necessary. The cross is not necessary. All this stuff's not necessary. Keep the focus on Christ and Christ crucified and Christ risen from the dead. Uh, where the Bible keeps the focus. Christ, the Savior. Don't get distracted off into trying to explain things that you don't have the answer for, nor does anyone else have the answer for. Uh, and don't let man's theology rule over your script over the scripture, because it will. When you adopt a, a theological system, whether it's Calvinism or Pentecostalism or Arminianism or uh, <clears throat> what else is out there, Wesleyanism, uh, 
or the myriad of other things. So city of Nizza, it is going to, it will affect how you read the scripture. And when you find scripture that does not agree with your model, with your theology, the proper response is to seek to understand it more clearly, and if you can't fit it into the model, realize that your model is defective, not the scripture. Now, some people even believe, even have believed that women can be pastors until they searched the scriptures and were eventually led to the truth. I do make mistakes, and I'm constantly find myself finding new things in the Scripture that I didn't understand. And I still don't understand the whole thing. And I, because I have a, a background where you, you, basically you don't have to fix what's not broke, so you focus on what's broke. Why? to protect people from it. You don't want them getting hurt. Focusing on some elements in Calvinism or other things can cause you problems because it distorts God's revelation. The eternal decree is not biblical. It's extra biblical of all things. I mean, again, if, if, if they would just leave their caveats, on, what, what is the purpose in even stating that? Well, it's because trying to protect God. God doesn't need you to protect him. He, he's, he's able to protect himself. Not that you can be a threat to him anyway. You want to fight with God? Go ahead. It won't come out good. Uh, so uh, that's what I wanted to say about this. And it did cause me some to, uh, some concern because I was thinking, D did I cause this guy to get into this strange position where he thinks that Calvinism is anti-Christianity or something? No, it's not. As I said, that, that the vast majority of what's in Calvin's Institutes is Christianity. Calvin's not a heretic. He just gets off. He's only in those small areas where he deals with this questions that you should, you know, what fools rush in where angels fear to tread. That instead of saying, no, this is this is just God's business. It's not my business. If I try to pry into it, I'm not. Gonna, it's going to cause me a problem because I won't understand. Uh, Calvin maybe went a little too far in what he should pry into. But he didn't. He, it's not from Calvin. It goes back to Aquinas. Uh, well, these guys didn't really quote from Aquinas much. It goes back to Augustine, and from Augustine, it goes back to Aristotle. And those li line of pagan. Th Arist uh, Augustine brought these ideas into Christianity. He's the main one. Some of these ideas, and others have tried to amplify those things trying to make sense out of things that don't actually make sense biblically. So, but that doesn't mean that somebody's not a Christian just because they're a Calvinist. That, that, that's foolish. That's like, like the saying that if a church has a woman pastor, they're all damned to go to hell. No, they're just confused. They're just confused. People can believe the Bible and be confused by about, about what it actually says, uh, including this old man. Just wanted to make that clear because I don't want to see people out there saying that Calvinists, because they are Calvinists, are going to hell. That's nonsense. If they go to hell, it's not because of that. It's because they don't believe in Christ. And that's not a problem that has to do with theology, really, at all. Not theological systems, not Christian theological systems. 
Okay, I hope, I don't know why anybody would want to listen to this for two hours and 15 minutes, but there it is. There it is. I just wanted to uh, respond on this because it's this really bad video. Um, you shouldn't know what you're talking about before you do it. I'm afraid somebody listened to me and got all their ideas about Calvinism, perhaps from me and maybe a couple other people. But this isn't... Uh, I, I've heard too many things that sound like something I might have said. No. That'd be a little out of context of the whole. No, that's that would be... Yeah, there are some problems, but basically it's biblical, mostly. It's, it's not a heresy, unless you make it into one.